Hello, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to do another fireside chat. And today, I have Will Harris, and he is the chief of the Harris family that's behind White Oak Pastures, one of my favorite regenerative farms where we buy most of our meat from, at least a whole lot of our meat from. And um, today, we want to talk a little bit about you know, what it means to raise livestock regeneratively, what it means for the health of the animal, for the health of the soil for our health ultimately because we're the ones you know eating the meat and how that is very much different to how most livestock is raised in this country and why the traditional way of raising livestock is a problem for all of those areas soil animal health um, or animal uh, welfare obviously for our own health and then I, I would like to talk also a little bit about the perceived and effective cost of food because if you go to the grocery store, you know, and you see like, you know, highly processed stuff that's super cheap. I mean, that's one of the main things that I've heard from a lot of people, especially those on a tight budget. Well, I can't afford grass fed, you know, I have to go to, you know, wherever, you know, and get the least expensive food. Um, and so that food is not truly that inexpensive. It just happens so that the U.S. government supports certain types of farming practices so that farmers can actually sell food um, below what it costs to make that food, you know, and that obviously then creates a huge discrepancy between, you know, buying food that's good for us and buying food that's not good for us, but that just happens to appear to be cheap, right? So that's also maybe something we can talk about that. And with that, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into um, regenerative farming. Um, what did you do before? It wasn't always regenerative as far as I understand. And then, you know, let's jump into some of those topics. Let's talk about, you know, how animals graze and live in the wild and why it's important for us or for you as, as a farmer to try to mimic that. Michael, thank you for having me on today. I appreciate the opportunity of, of sharing uh, what we do here on the farm with you and, and your, your audience. So uh, I am Will Harris. I'm the fourth generation of my family to manage this farm, White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia. I'm uh, aided by my two daughters and their spouses who are the fifth generation. And they all have babies who are now the sixth generation, although they're still babies. <laughs> uh, you know, the thing that uh, today on the farm, we pasture raise five different red meat species, cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits. And we hand butcher them here on the farm. We pasture raise five poultry species, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, and ducks, and we hand butcher them here on the farm. We raise organic vegetables, uh, pastured eggs, honey, and a bunch of other little ancillary businesses. And the thing I enjoy most about the farm is how in the five or six generations, 150 something years, it's come full cycle. You know, my great grandfather and grandfather ran the farm in the uh, late 1860s, uh, early, late 1800s, early 1900s. And the farm would have looked a lot like it looks today in terms of what they raised. And the focus would have been on the, the land, the animals, and the community. Because that's the way people farm that are. Right. My dad took over the farm post-World War II. He was born in 1920, took over the farm in 1946. And he made the sweeping changes to the farm that happened in American agriculture after World War II. We could talk about it all day, but he centralized, industrialized, and commoditized the farm. And under him, it became a monoculture, pure cattle production using all the tools that technology had given us in that era, him in that era, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, uh, hormone implants to the, to the cattle, subtherapeutic antibiotics, the list goes on and on. Right. He ran the farm very successfully all of his life. I went to the University of Georgia, majored in animal science, and came back and ran it very industrially for 20 20 years. I graduated from the Ag College in uh, 1976, and I ran it as an industrial monoculture of cattle until the mid-90s. Uh, 
in the mid 90s, I started transitioning over to the model that where we are today that I explained to you earlier. Mm-hmm. And we, we just uh, just been happier and healthier and felt better about what we do in every sense. What does it mean in terms of, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the use of antibiotics and all of those things that go along with traditional ways of raising um, cattle. How is it different from how a cow or let's say a wild bison, you know, would would graze and, and roam around and, and do its thing in, in nature? What do those animals do and what impact does it have on the soil and ultimately on their own health? Yeah. So uh, what, what we do now, we refer to as biomimicry, the emulation of nature. Mm-hmm. And, and we have made very conscious choices in how we manage our land and animals based mostly on observation of, of how the natural cycles, the cycles of nature were functioning before we humans broke those cycles with, with technology. Right. Uh, and it, and it's, a, it's just a much, a much healthier system. You know, we, uh, uh, before our management was very siloed, you know, we, uh, we had a, we spotted a pest and we killed that pest. And there were unintended consequences to killing the pest, but that's the, the thought process. Mm-hmm. Today, we refer to what we do as holistic. And in the, the process of managing this complex operation, we, we consider the whole and not, not the silent. Right. So from a, you know, just practical perspective, if you were to observe bison, let's say, in, in, in nature, you know, they would, you know, graze in a certain area and they were obviously, they, had, they have predators, right? And those predators have an impact on how those animals graze. They wouldn't stick around for too long on one particular, you know, piece of land. They would move on, they would migrate, they would, you know, stick together as a, as a herd because the herd is, can better protect uh, itself than the individual animal, right? And so all of that sticking together and, and moving all the time has an impact on the soil because the soil never gets, um, or that the land never gets overgrazed. It never gets destroyed enough, uh, but it gets fertilized at the same time by all the manure and you know, all the, the stuff that, you know, bison, let's say, do. And so, you know, stuff grows back and they just keep, you know, rotating and maybe at some point they'll end up at the same spot where they, where they started. And that's kind of, I think, the idea behind, you know, the rotational grazing that you guys do with, well, with most livestock, really, right? Because it's not only limited to cattle. You know, you, you move your pigs, right? You move your chickens, I would assume, and, and everything, everything in between. You're exactly right. Constant animal movement is essential to our program. Uh, your confinement animal feeding operations, CAFOs, Mm-hmm. are a function of that industrialization that I mentioned earlier. Uh, previously, I, uh, when we were a monoculture of only corn, of only cattle, I grew corn and other feeds and fed, fed the cattle as they stood in one place uh, in a feedlot. Uh, when we changed it, we, uh, the, the biomimicry, the emulation of nature I mentioned uh, of your, your example is a great one. The, the buffalo being slowly chased across the Great Plains by predators, timber wolves, whatever. It could be even in gazelle in Africa. It could right. be caribou in the, in the uh, tundra being moved by poet. The constant movement of animals slowly chased across the last landscape by predators was beneficial for the land and the animals. The predators took out the old, the weak, the malformed, keeping the herd strong. The, the animals were constantly moving across the landscape, giving the land a very hard animal impact and a long recovery time. Mm-hmm. Those ruminants we mentioned are, were, were our prey animals. They protect themselves by bunching together. So their impact on well, that landscape would have been very hard, but there's a long recovery time. That's the way the earth evolved. And all those, all those ruminant animals with those cloven hooves 
a lot of urine, a lot of feces, pushing it into the ground, feeding microbes that fed the grass, that fed the animals. Sure, and that and that that animal impact, all that urine, feces, pushed into the soil with those cloven hooves, fed the microbes, that fed the plants, that fed the animals. We talk about birth, growth, death, decay, birth, growth, death, decay, birth, growth, death, decay. Right. And then the, 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 that cycle leads to the cycles of nature. Mm -hmm. The industrialization broke the cycles of nature. <clears throat> the cycles of nature are, to name a few, <clears throat> the carbon cycle, the microbial cycle, mineral cycle, uh, uh, nitrogen cycle, uh, water cycle, energy cycle with the sun, many cycles of nature. When those cycles of nature are operating optimally, it generates an abundance. Right. And that abundance is what we live on. You right. Know, the, uh, I heard a speaker recently say that there was a, a, a herbaceous dinosaur, or maybe a brontosaurus, maybe not that his body, its body was three and a half times as big as a horse. Excuse me, as big as an elephant. Mm -hmm. but his head was as big as a horse. Can you imagine how, nut how nutrient dense forage must have been? This was mm -hmm. a herbivore, a living part. Right. How, how nutrient dense that forage must have been when an animal with a head as big as a horse to feed an animal three and a half times as big as an uh, elephant. I mean, that's right. just incredible to me. Yeah. You know, we, we are, you know, an evidence of that abundance when those cycles of nature were operating optimally is all that fossil fuel in the ground. Right. And all, that, all that oil and coal and gas is the radiant energy of the sun that was captured in the era of the dinosaur. Right. And we, but you know, we humans, we puny little humans have broke those cycles by using pesticides and chemical fertilizers and other technology, technology tools. Right, which at the end of the day, if, if you think about it, you, you cannot, if you don't feed the soil, nothing is gonna grow, right? So you either use food that comes naturally from within those cycles where us as humans don't really have to add anything or you revert to, you know, fertilizers and, and, and other chemicals to kind of, you know, to do the same, but in a way that, that's not in line with those cycles. And so if you think about it, you know, in a classic feedlot type of operation where you have all the cattle, you know, stationary in, in one area, and then, you know, they still produce the same type of manure that would otherwise feed the soil. But now you have the problem of where to put that stuff, right? So you have to move that away and at the same time instead of using what cattle naturally you know produce you bring in also those chemical fertilizers to you know compensate for the lack of manure and at the end of the day that's crazy you know i mean instead of just letting nature do its thing and just trying to manage that you know like move the cattle every so often etc you know we we go we jump through hoops to try to make it better not realizing that nothing that humans have done so far that I'm aware of is better than what nature already does. You know, it's really, it's really incredible isn't it? that the hubris of we humans believe that we can just do it better than nature. All right. You know, there's, there's a drug that'll do it. I mean, if you take, if you take uh, steroids, you'll be much bigger and stronger than you would be otherwise, and there right. won't be any, there won't be any unintended consequences. All right. So, Except they always are. I mean, right. yeah, yep. it's it's truly incredible what we allow ourselves to believe about right. what we can do versus what nature do. Right. Now, what what do you say to that argument if someone says, "Well, but if we don't use industrial ways of farming, we couldn't feed everyone." I, lo I love that. I love that discussion. And, uh, and here's the answer: the Earth has a limited carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that, that none of us want to hear. It. And when we overpopulate the earth, it won't go well. Right. Now, 
we could we can have a discussion. I welcome the discussion about what farming method will feed more people on this earth. And the industrial model that we operate with now will feed more people than my model, more people, if acreage of land is the first resource that we run out of. Right. The industrial commodity centralized industrialized model is better than mine, mm -hmm. just based on per acre. If if if, if nothing else matters, everything else is a boom. Mm -hmm. But now, if water is an issue, I can feed more people. Right. If fossil, if fossil fuel is an issue, I can feed more people. If uh, dim dim uh, diminished resources like potassium and phosphate, this, this reduction that's dug out of the ground, I can be, be more people. If uh, antibiotics that the pathogens aren't resistant to, I can feed more people. Mm -hmm. If the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and other oceans of the world are an issue, I can feed more people. Right. I can go through many, many, many scenarios where my methods of producing food are far more resilient Mm -hmm. You know the uh, than the than the industrial methods, but we 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 uh, you know the, the, you know Michael there's so much money in the, in the input business. So many people selling so much so much product, you know, so much money that that nobody wants to really drill down to what's true. And right. you know, what's true. Yeah. Yeah. What's true is if the, the, the most food is produced when the cycles of nature are operating optimally. And nobody makes money on the cycles of nature. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree. And, and plus, you know, the thing is, at some point, we'll run out of soil that you can grow stuff on, regardless of how much, you know, chemicals you throw on top. And, and also, most of the land um that is available to us you know is 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 not you can't grow stuff on it like in terms of plants but you can could put cattle on it right uh they have the capacity to actually make that land better and fertile again so you can either you know continue with your regenerative practices or start growing stuff but if, if there is land that cannot be used to, you know, grow corn or soy or what have you, because it's too hilly, if it's too dry, if it's too steep, if it, whatever the case might be, and that applies to most of the farmland in this country, I understand, then, you know, regenerative farming doesn't really take away land from those practices, you know, you can use land that otherwise would be unusable, right? Well, the, the, the earth evolved with animal impact as, as part of the evolution. Mm. You know, different animals in different ecosystems, but the earth evolved with animal impact. And uh, health, the ecosystem is one in which the evolution is emulated. And when, you, when, if, when we take animals out of the equation, we change the recipe. You know, if you if you are trying to start restart those cycles of nature and then get them operating optimally, but you said, but I don't want animal impact. That's like saying you're going to cook a cake using your mother's cake recipe, but you're going to leave the sugar out. It's right. not the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I can tell you as a practitioner of regenerative land management for 25 years. Not many people have been in this space as long as I have. After 25 years of regenerating degraded landscapes, I can tell you there is no cost-effective way to regenerate a degraded uh, soil without animals. You, you, they're just necessary. They were part of the plan from the beginning. And so we're just not going to do that anymore. We're just not going to use them is a uh, false narrative. That's not going to work. You know, you, yeah. you know, uh, uh, a, uh, Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos may be able to take a small area and pour enough money into it somehow, but to cost effectively regenerate these vast landscapes that we have de de degraded 
on the face of the, the whole world requires right. animal input. Right. Uh, and, and even you know, speaking of, of animal input, even, you know, growing, you know, organically produced, um, you know, vegetables, let's say, or, or fruit, you know, very often those farmers bring in then, you know, blood meat or feather meat or, you know, some animal product to fertilize those plants. So even if you say, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with animals. I'm a, you know, plant-based vegan, what have you, you know, chances are your broccoli actually used animal input, you know, to become, you know, a, an organic broccoli, you know, and that's, again, goes to the point that without animal input, it's, it's nearly impossible to grow stuff and to support those cycles if you want to do it right. In my mind, in my mind the, king, the living kingdom is animals, plants, and microbes. Mm -hmm. The three have a codependency upon each other. You know, insects are part of that. Insects wow. are part of the animal kingdom, but are part of that. Yeah. So to, uh, to say we're just not going to uh, have this essential component as part of the recipe is, is ludicrous. Right, delusional, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of, you know, the, the price of, of raising cattle the way you do, or any other livestock for that matter, and comparing that with, you know, other types of, of food, uh, agricultural food products. One could argue that, well, you know, pasture-raised, regenerative farm, et, et cetera, is much more expensive and it's hard to afford. Um, but that probably doesn't take into account. I mean, that, that might be true to an extent. And maybe that's because there is not a whole, not as much demand for regeneratively produced, you know, meat than for conventional meat. Or maybe it's also because um, we as a society financially support the wrong way of farming and allowing farmers basically. And that's, I think, especially true in the area of, of growing certain crops like corn and soy, allowing farmers to produce stuff that they then sell for less than what it costs to make it. And that skews obviously the entire picture and the, the food pricing in general, because the food that you eat that's made out of corn or soy isn't really as inexpensive as, you, as what you pay. It costs significantly more. It's just that the government and ultimately taxpayers, I would assume, pick up the tap and bridge the difference. Is that right? Yes. The price disparity that you are addressing has many, has many layers to it. And the really the, the, the easiest one to argue is, is what the one you brought up, the, the subsidies. Mm -hmm. you know, the, most of the crops, grow, most of the commodity crops grown in this country are grown at or below cost of production and the farmers stay in business with the government subsidies. And that, that's, that's an argument. It is inarguable. We can be shown over and over economically in, in, in most crops. But right. for a minute, let's go to what's more important. That's true. Well, what we just said is true, but there's a, there's a more important level to it. And that is the fact, not, not just the subsidies, but the fact that we have uh, outsourced uh, the expenses, the, of, of many, uh, many of the expenses. Uh, we, you know, if you, well, I mean, what, what would it cost? What would it cost somebody to clean up the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico? The, that, that, that's a result of chemical fertilizers and pesticides washing down. It's as big as one of the New England states right now and growing. What's it going to cost to clean that up? Mm -hmm. But that cost. It's, it's there. It's going to be born at some point. But it's been externalized right. out of the food production system. Mm -hmm. what, what, uh, if, if you believe, as I do, that uh, that food production impacts climate change and the the uh, many of the horrible weather events that that we will be paying for in the past and present and the future uh, were caused at least in part by cheap food production, but we've externalized that. I mean, how much did Hurricane Michael cost? You know, how much, and you know, what, what about health issues? What if, you know, people argue, but what if, if just a little bit of the diseases that we're, the health crisis we're having, for, that we're paying for now, it, that it's caused by cheap food. Mm -hmm. that, that cost is externalized. Right. You know, uh, 
I can go on and on with huge, huge expenses that are going to be borne by somebody other than the food system. Right. Was caused by the food system. Yeah. So, you know, to, uh, how much, what, what it cost or what it's cost if you consider the externalized cost is two very different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The other day, I, I I heard an interview with a with a family um, on on a on a very tight budget, and they said, well, you know, if they have to pick between something organically grown or pasteurized and a meal from Burger King, which is I don't know two dollars with a, a soft drink, or I don't know what the price was, but it was very inexpensive. Um, you know, they have to pick the Burger King, but at the same time, you know, the dad had diabetes, you know spent 150 bucks or so or more a month on just medication to manage the diabetes it was i would argue most likely influenced by his dietary lifestyle right and so but people don't connect those two things you know like well food is one bucket my food budget and health is another bucket but is it really because if you do this right and maybe some other you know lifestyle factors you don't have to worry about the health you know you don't have to worry about health insurance necessarily, or, you know, medical bills and all of that stuff. Because if you're healthy, you know, you're good. And you can only be healthy if you eat well. And eating that crap food is not going to get you there. It's, you're going to pay for that, even on an individual basis. You know, even if you take all the, the external factors out of the equation on an individual basis, you will be paying for the poor food choices that you are making today, you know? And so if you go to, if you go to Starbucks, you pay six or eight dollars for a cup of coffee. The sugar's over there on the counter. It's free. You can get as much sugar as you want to for nothing. Right. That don't mean it's good for you. Right. Yeah. The, the cheapest calories aren't the best calories. Right. Yeah. I agree. Now, if someone says, "Well, you know, I, I do realize you know, I, I need to eat better. I want to eat grass-fed and you know regeneratively raised meat, etc." What are some of the things that people can do? to that are on a, on, a, on a budget to afford you know the, the better meat you know i know that there are you know different or certain cuts of meat that are likely less expensive than you know your grass-fed ribeye steak you know it, it doesn't have to be steak all the time there are other parts of the animal that you that you can produce cheaper and that consumers then can buy for less right sure and the, the, the whole nose to tail thing is, is really part of that uh and, I, and, and there are things, but buying bulk, there, there are a number of things you can do, but I think we got to face the fact. And the fact is, uh, sadly, so too many people can't afford food that's raised properly. Right. Very sad. And and I, sometimes I have visitors, we have a lot of visitors here on the farm. Sometimes they say, very, very well meaning people say, I really, I've seen what you do here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. But what can you do to get the food to, to, to really underserved communities, really poor people that can't afford it? I, I got to tell you, Michael, that, that, that kind of hits me wrong because what those people are doing is taking two of the greatest problems that exist today. That is the dearth of food that's raised properly and income disparity. Mm -hmm. It's two huge problems and two very different problems. Right. And the same guy can't fix both of them. <laughs> right. that, that's not my way of life. You know, right. we, we, me and people like me, have really, I think, made a lot of progress in the last 20 or 30 years figuring out what's wrong with the food system and figuring out what we can do to fix it and make it better. And the fact is, when, when we, we farmers, we regenerative farmers, give up the tools that science gave us that take cost out of production, we add cost back to production. Right. When, we, when we re internalize those externalized expenses that we talk about, the price of the food goes up. So uh, I, nobody wants. Poor people, you know, I see little pre young pregnant girls eating cheap, buying cheap stuff at the grocery store. I, I don't want that. Little pregnant, you know, 20 something year old pregnant girls, I want them to eat my food. 
but it costs more and they may not be able to afford it. Right. So we got to do two things. We've got to fix the food production system, and we can. There are those of us that, that have figured it out and, and, and welcome the rest of the world to come and look and see. Not mm-hmm. just me. There's a bunch of us. Me, Gabe Brown, Spencer Smith, uh, uh, Greg Gunthorpe. The country's full of us. And then there is income disparity. And, you know, other people got to fix that. That's two very different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I trust some, some, some anecdotal evidence here. You know, we have, um, we have a bunch of chickens, egg layers in, a, in our backyard because we figured, you know, we want to do, I want to do it the best way I possibly can to A, learn and B, you know, to produce some of our own food. And I can tell you, you know, and it's a small operation because we only have 16 birds, but buying the organic corn and soy free feed for our chickens letting them, you know, roam around in a pasture and dealing with, you know, losses from hawk attacks and stuff makes the eggs we eat every day, arguably one of the most expensive eggs we've ever had. And there, there is no way that I see, you know, even if I would increase volume and, you know, and all of that to get that cost down to what, you know, someone would pay at the, at the store, you know, for, for regular eggs. There is just no way to produce quality food at the price that people expect because of all the reasons, you know, you mentioned and, and many others as well that, you know, distort uh, the, the food pricing at the end of the day. And, um, and, and yeah, and that's just unfortunately, you know, a, a fact. And make, make, make no mistake, people are getting what they're paying for. Yeah. And, it, and it's sad because, uh, you know, an egg raised well, like you're doing it, an egg raised in a multi-level house, they're in the same package, in that same shell. They look right. a lot alike, but it's not the same crop. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. All right, well, we unpacked a couple um, a couple of different topics, but there's one more thing maybe that, um, that I'd like to talk about, and, and that is what are some of the what are some of the things that keep you up at night or that, that you struggle with or that you battle on an ongoing basis to do what you do basically and, and do it in a way that's profitable because if you're not profitable you're not going to be doing it for very long right so you need to to make it work economically and what are some of those challenges to you know that you face you know i am uh I, you know, I admit i plead guilty to being a deliriously happy person i uh, spent the last 67 years getting this this place like i want it and we made a lot of, a lot, had a lot of success with it i'm a very happy person mm-hmm. but to, to answer your question is the 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 disparity in the modern capitalization capitalization system capital market versus the econo- economics of what we do here you know I, I, i'm okay you know i started very early uh 25 30 years ago i inherited a nice farm i was early into uh, this movement so uh, our our farm is, is, is cash flow positive and we're doing okay. Mm-hmm. But it's only because we started so early and operated a scale and we, we've, by one, for one way or another, we made some right steps and, and it works for us, but the system doesn't work. So we live in a system where uh, capital is available based on how high the return is in the very short window. You know, quarter, you know multinational uh, corporate corporations operate on a quarterly report, annual report. Uh, they're performing or they're not performing. And here, it's multi-generational. You know, right. investment made today won't yield its return for uh, decades, mm-hmm. literally another generation. Right. And uh, I worry about the uh, the future of this kind of farming that is still just so small, so mm-hmm. embryonic, uh, fitting so poorly into the capital system that we have. Right. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know a lot about economics. You know, my, my degree is in animal science, and my experience has been in, in farming, the land, the animals, community. But 
the the way we count our money does not work for this kind of long term right. program. And if we hope that uh, others will be able to to do this and it'll grow and become a a uh, way of life, a way of producing food on the planet. It's just really worrisome about the economics of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 is very worrying. There, there, we're actually uh, we sold the book rights to White Oak Pastures, and the book's being written right now. And a lot of it gets back to a, uh, the economic uh, difficulty mm -hmm. of changing this food system. Right. Yeah. And with, you know, the people like Bill Gates and stuff who want to grow meat in a lab and, you know, who buy up all the farmland, it's probably not going to get any easier for someone who wants to, you know, to start now doing what you do. Let, uh, this may be too much in the weeds. I'm going to cut it out if you don't like it. Said, well, you know, if, you, if you look at the food, produ the food production system, the linear food production system that we're part of, well, first of all, we're not part of it. We are a food production system, a tiny, tiny little mechanism of a food production system. But the, the one that feeds us all is huge and it's linear. And on one end are the big ag companies that sell the inputs to farmers. Most of those inputs are damaging to the environment, to our health, too. But, but that's, that's, that's what happens. They produce it and sell it to farmers. Farmers are kind of a thin line here. We're the guys that own most of the land. We do most of the, the work in the fields. We take a lot of the risks. We, and then past us is big, big food. Mm -hmm. Big ag, big ag. Farmers, big food. And then that goes, then their customers are big grocery, big food service, whose customers are consumers. So the question is, Wow, how did it evolve like that? This big, tiny, new big. That's, that's, that's really odd, you know, in a right. chain. And, and the answer is because <clears throat> land has always been so key. And, and nobody, even the Bezoses and the Warren Buffetts and the Bill Gates world could own enough land to make all that work. Mm -hmm. So they let us own the land. And we could, you know, why would you want a cow if you can get all the milk you want free? So you want, they, we, we provided the service at below cost, it would cost them milk. Mm -hmm. But now we're on the other end and we're talking about this vertical farming. And we're talking about uh, uh, pro, uh, uh, plant based protein. And things that really don't need farmers and land much. Right. I don't think they buying land, but really, it's. Uh, I think we're at a, <clears throat> a revolutionary point in this system, and I don't know exactly how that's going to come out, but I, I think it's probably going to not be good for yeah. consumers. I right. know it's not going to be good for farmers. Right. Probably, right. I think it'll be equally bad for consumers. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I think with that, we're gonna, uh, we can wrap it up. I thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I'm going to have some links and down below in the description. If the people want to you know, buy stuff from you, which I highly encourage, we just got uh, half a cow or the meat of half a cow. I'm going to put in a picture up here on the side uh, with all the boxes in our driveway. Um, so hopefully that'll last for the next couple of months for us. Um, and I encourage everyone to do the same, you know, check out White Oak, um, the best meat I've ever had really. And um, they do stuff right, and, and I really appreciate it. And I'm willing to pay a little bit extra for that, um, knowing that it's good for, for you guys so you can continue. It's good for the land, it's good for the animals, and it's ultimately also good for me. Uh, and that's you know the one reason why the main reason why, you know, here at least we here at the Kuma tribe, we do what we do. We try to eat only pasture-raised and grass-fed and regeneratively farmed. Um, and I encourage everyone to you know give that a try as well, because you know, you either pay a little bit more now or you pay a whole lot of later when all the medical bills come in and you have to you know deal with medication and chronic disease and all of the stuff that lifestyle can ultimately prevent if done right and um yeah with that we're going to wrap it up i'm going to look forward again to uh, seeing you at the farm i know that we actually shook hands and but you weren't wearing your head remember that day you were sitting with jody outside the general store and your head was on the table 
and you said hello and and you know shook my hand and i said hello and then i walked away and, and i'm like i think it was will harris but i didn't recognize you because you weren't wearing a hat <laughs> so i apologize for that <laughs> Well, uh, I hope you'll come back again soon. I lo love to host you, and uh, thank you very much for having us on the show today. It's, it's an honor. Absolutely. I appreciate it, too. Thanks. Thanks for your time, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you.